available on iOS and Android devices. Go to www.ddpyoga.com forward slash Austin. It'll have you on your way to not only changing your life, but owning your life. And hey, man, as a shout out to Brady, congratulations, man, on sticking with it. And thank you for that badass letter. Thank you. The following program is a Podcast One.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. All right, everybody, welcome to Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the main streets of Reno, Nevada. That's right. I'm out here visiting my brother-in-law, getting ready for my mule deer hunt here in a couple of weeks. November 1 through 5. And I thought I was going to get a chance to come out here and do some scouting. And not going to be able to do any scouting, but I'm having a good time out here in the mountains. God dang, me and my wife loaded up the Yukon XL and hauled ass. Well, actually, we took our time. Didn't get in a rush. Moolah and Callie loaded in the back with all of our stuff. And we made it out here safe and sound. I got a good podcast for you today. I felt like talking about wrestling, professional wrestling. So I call my good buddy from MLW, Court Bauer. I said, hey, man, you want to shoot the breeze today and talk about some pro wrestling? He goes, hell yeah. So I Skyped up with him, and today we're just shooting the breeze and talking about the business of pro wrestling. The show he just had down there in Orlando, Florida. He's got another one coming up, talking about some of the things ongoing in WWE and the wrestling world, some talent, some storylines going on within WWE, and some real storylines that are actually happening in real life within the company so today we're just shooting the breeze and we talked for about an hour and 15 hour and 20 minutes so i'm going to keep this open to uh i'm going to keep this open pretty short because i got a slam dunk of a show for thursday and i'm going to be able to use the salt and pepper on the words that i want to use so i'm going to keep this open short take care of a piece of business here and i'm coming back with court bauer of mlw but first the biggest video game franchise in WWE history is back with WWE 2K18. Featuring cover superstar Seth Rollins, WWE 2K18 promises to bring you closer to the ring than ever before with hard-hitting action, new game modes including the addition of eight-man matches, deeper creation capabilities, a new grapple carry system, thousands of new animations and a massive backstage area plus wwe 2k18 features a brand new rendering engine that also gives the franchise a visual overhaul bringing the drama of wwe to life like never before dominating the ring with your favorite wwe nxt and legendary superstars including me Stone Cold Steve Austin, WWE 2K18 offers the most complete roster of the biggest and brightest WWE and NXT superstars and legends to ever grace a WWE ring. Also, be sure to check out the official WWE 2K18 in-game soundtrack, personally curated by executive producer Dwayne The Rock Johnson, available now on Apple Music. To learn more about WWE 2K18, Head on over to WWE.2K.com and buy now. And that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. Hello, Dick Enberg here, and I'm mighty excited to announce the start of my new show, Sound of Success, right here on Podcast One. For 60 years, I've rubbed shoulders with sports greatness, from athletes in the world of football, baseball, college, and professional basketball, golf, tennis, the Olympics, and so much more. Join me as I explore in-depth stories from the greatest figures in the world of sport, and I'll share a few of my own. Download new episodes of Sound of Success every Thursday on the Podcast One one app, Apple Podcasts, and PodcastOne.com. Oh, my. This is the Steve Austin Show. Hey, it's been a while since I talked to you. How'd you show in Florida go? Really good. We uh, we uh, sold out virtually every ticket here, except for standing room only, and uh, packed the place, which I was excited about, and uh, had a hell of a show. We had uh, Filthy Tom Lawler versus Olympian and Jeff Cobb, and MVP and Sammy Callahan brawl all over the place, threw chairs on each other. It was pretty wild. And then Ricochet and uh, Shane Strickland went 35 minutes in the main event, so we were real happy. And Tony Schiavone dusted off the microphone and came back and uh, said it was a one-shot, and surprise, surprise, well, he's going to be back December 7th, and along with everyone else at MLW, because we're going to be returning to Orlando uh, this uh, this December. Tickets go on sale this Friday 
at uh, 10 a.m. at MLW.com, and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. I think the the show was a lot of uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun for me to go back in there. I didn't know promoting if it was something I was going to enjoy doing, but I was surrounded by a great team and uh, some great talent out there and great fans too. So we're going to go two for two in uh, December and do Never Say Never, which was an appropriate title for the show, and uh, <laughs> return to Orlando at Guilt Nightclub. So That's we'll awesome. Man. Hey, how was it seeing Tony Schiavone? I mean, I know you were down there in Florida earlier promoting, but did you get a chance right. to see him then, or was this the first time you've seen him in a lot of years? Because I haven't seen Tony. Holy smokes, I'm going way back to right. – I guess it was uh, 96, and I think that was when we did the, the Pillman gun angle at Brian Pillman's house, and uh, we finished that gig, and it was one of those rare times when both territories are crossing over the same plane. Mm-hmm. And I was walking through the airport, and there's a bunch of WCW guys there. I would just left the company maybe six, nine months before, and there was Tony. We kind of crossed paths, didn't say anything to each other. But I always thought he was a really good commentator. So uh, how was it reconnecting with him? I know you were doing a little bit of podcast stuff with him back in the day, so what was that all about? Yeah, we got him to start his own podcast in January where he looks back on the Crockett era and uh, WCW and does that with Conrad Thompson every Monday. And so it was his kind of slow reintroduction to uh, the business. And he, you know, he was a lifelong fan. He used to take the bus to all the Crockett shows back in the 70s when he was in high school and in college. And uh, it's, been, it's been fun. I, I actually first met Tony backstage – Around WrestleMania uh, time for Jim Ross's show, he was backstage at JR's show this uh, this past year in Orlando. That's the first time I actually got to meet him. Uh, having worked with him on the podcast, now taking him and putting him back in the booth, which I thought would be – I had all these notes written how I was going to recruit him and try to sell him into doing this. <laughs> and it, I didn't need him. He actually very quickly said, sure, I'll do it. And I was like, oh, shit. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, OK, great. But the craziest thing about Tony Schiavone and working with him – is that in 2017 he has the sweetest mullet I've ever seen. By any error standards, he is rocking the best mullet. Kenny Powers move over. This this is the greatest mullet ever. How old is Tony? About 50, yeah, his late 50s. No receding hairline, nothing? Oh, no, dude. He has more hair than he knows what to do with. He's got a beard now, and uh, he's calling the Atlanta Braves uh, down in Atlanta, and they're... Uh, their uh, farm team he also calls uh, georgia basketball georgia football and so he keeps very active and now he has a podcast and he's our uh, announcer along with rich brennan formerly formerly of nxt now known as rich bocchini and so we have a great broadcast team uh, it really to have a guy that has that polish uh behind him along with rich as well and i love how they call it because tony who's since leaving WCW or WCW leaving the business, uh, he's been doing real sports. And so he calls it kind of old school style, like it used to be called as a sport. And I love it. It's a very authentic call of the action. And he puts in, he puts in the time, he puts in the time to do the research. And, uh, if you want to hear Tony, the the show is available for four 99 to stream or download at MLW.tv. And, uh, it, it was great having him back. It really, you don't realize how much you've missed Tony until you hear him, and he's just a very warm voice, kind of like Lance Russell and very inviting, but he really calls it authentically, which is missing today, I think, from wrestling in that it feels very homogenized and kind of uh, milquetoast, and, and Tony – gave the show, gave the wrestlers, added, incredib- added a credibility to it, and I think that's important. You know, you sent me a link to the show, and I've, I've been meaning to watch it, and I'm going to, and I wanted to watch it for the matches, but also wanted to watch just to listen to Tony, because, you know, I forgot how good that guy was. I was on uh, YouTube just the other day watching some old Dusty Road stuff, and, you know, Tony interacted with all those guys. And like you said, he was a big fan coming up, so anyway, he gets behind a microphone, and, you know, Jesus Christ, before I even got in the business, I was listening to Tony Schiavone, and, and also, right. he just brought that, uh, he, he brought a real organic enthusiasm to it, high energy, and, and him as as far as his facials and his body language remained very calm but the enthusiasm the inflection was, was in his voice so i just really enjoyed him and, and i really forgot how much i enjoyed him until i started watching some of that old stuff back so i just wondered did he did he uh with calling all the stuff that he's doing in atlanta now is this style the same as what he was doing back in the wcw days yeah it's i mean yes it, and it's it, it 
it it's not nostalgic in that he doesn't have these cliche sayings and right. he keeps knocking them out. It's it's he's just calling it straightforward, and all that's changed is the the, the, the where are they fighting over, who's fighting over what. Uh, but uh, he he's very much in the here and now because he hasn't stopped calling the action. It's just it was on a ball field instead of uh, the squared circle the last few years, and so he's he's right there and he's he hasn't missed a beat. And uh, I, I think for him to come back and be so well received I think was uh, something he may he may have been a little surprised by but I knew that he was the right guy for the job and I knew that teaming up with Rich would be just it would make it makes the broadcast much easier for me because I know I'm in good hands with those two guys uh, but he he was great and, and they had you know he also has uh, he, he Good timing in terms of his comedy. He knows how to set things up. He knows how to put over guys. We had a 460 pound, 469 super heavyweight, uh, 469 pounder super heavyweight, and he set that guy up perfectly. And how they called the match was just perfect. It went eight seconds. Spoiler alert. But uh, he, <laughs> they, he did a really good job. And you know, you get deep into the show. How is he going to handle a 35 minute match with all this cutting edge wrestling? And uh, yet it was it was it was had a really compelling story to it in that you had uh, this guy who looked up to um, the the guy uh, in Ricochet, and so Shane Strickland sees his friend and now turned bitter rival, and, and who's the better man? Who's number one? And that's the, that's the story. And so Tony's told similar stories over the years. It's just with different wrestlers doing moves that break gravity today. So he did a he did a phenomenal job. And so I was thrilled that he uh, he even said on his podcast last week that was it. I'm one and done, and it was fun. But that's it. And then this week he said, well, I'll be back in in December. And I, I have a pretty good idea that moving forward Tony's going to be joining us on a regular basis because uh, the Orlando Sentinel put out there uh, yesterday that we are exploring uh, turning this into a monthly thing down in Florida with a full-on return for MLW. So uh, having Tony in the mix is, again, makes my job a lot easier, especially if we are looking to do stuff like that. How did you do with some of the things that Ricochet does? I don't even know how to explain. So, and, and Tony's <laughs> from an older school, uh, from mm -hmm. real, real old school. So how was he able to handle that? Well, the great thing is when you do your research, you can fire up YouTube, and one of the things you'll see for Shane Strickland or Ricochet or any of these guys, a lot of people put these great videos together, like the 10 best moves that Ricochet does right. or whoever the wrestler is. So they'll ID the move, you'll see it, and you'll see a few versions of it. So doing your research today as an announcer is infinitely easier than it probably was 10, 15 years ago because you have all this great stuff that fans make and generate. So for him to learn those moves and for him to have an understanding of what kind of wrestler she's about to see – because of things like YouTube, it's so much easier than it ever was. I mean, just you know, you used to have to hunt down the tape. Someone would have, you have to know someone to make the tape for, it, and you don't have those issues now. Does he show up with a bunch of notes in hand? He had a book of research along with uh, Rich, and they were making a lot of notes on the side of this printout and stuff. I mean, they yes, they were. He was very prepared, but again, he, he, there's a calmness because you have two polished broadcasters that have been at the highest levels and uh, have actively continued to be at the highest levels. So it wasn't like these guys were uh, – you can tell they were not even anxious. Like Tony was just smooth as silk like his mullet right before showtime. He was easy and uh, he wasn't – you could tell he was uh, ready to rock and roll. So when is that next show? December 7th at Guilt Nightclub in uh, in Orlando. So we have a little bit of time to prepare for the next show. But I can tell you we are just about signed, sealed, and delivered on one of the big matches, which would be Filthy Tom Lawler versus Matt Riddle, which I think is going to be a huge one. So are you going to bring back Ricochet and Strickland, or did they settle our differences? Well, I don't want to ruin the end of the match, but uh, you guys got to stay tuned. 10-4 will do. I got to check it out. And they can check it out where, Court? Uh, MLW.tv. You can you can stream it or download it. Uh, it's on demand now. MLW One Shot. If you want to learn more about MLW and Major League Wrestling, the promotion, you just go to MLW.com. We have all the latest news, interviews, all that good stuff there, like any wrestling promotion site. Hey, one last question about Tony Schiavone. Yeah. Uh, did sure. you reach out to him to start a podcast, or how did that happen? 
It was a process because uh, Conrad Thompson, who was working with Bruce uh, and still does work with Bruce Pritchard on something to wrestle with, was looking at other uh, the, the the opposite side of, of the conversation. We know the WWE slash WWF version with Bruce, but it was interesting to get someone that was really along for the full ride for WCW. And Tony Schiavone, with the exception of one year where he was with WWE around 90, 89, 90, he was there from the Crockett era and the early 80s and the first Starcade all the way through to the last day. So he was a real interesting candidate for this, and he'd been killing it doing uh, some some fan conventions. And so we talked about it, and I said, yeah, if, if he's down, let's do it. And Tony was uh, surprisingly down to do it. So I, I was really excited that he came aboard because uh, he has a, a, so much knowledge, so much insight. Uh, he's just a good storyteller. And How uh, is his recall? Because he, I was just talking with Raven the other day. He was on a podcast, yeah. and he has his own podcast, The Raven Effect, drops every Monday on Podcast One. And he's, he's like me. I mean, a lot of the boys, they don't remember half the stuff that they did. I don't need, I don't remember probably three-quarters of my run. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. But, you know, when you talk to the Cornets, or the Vince Russo's, I mean, those guys, because, you know, a lot of times they were booking, they, they wrote a lot of stuff down, but they have tremendous mm-hmm. recall to begin with. So what, what is it with Tony? Does he stay razor sharp? Does he remember all the details? I, I think he's just like anyone in that there's stuff that he can recall vividly, and there's other stuff he doesn't even remember it happening. Because it's just, you think about the amount of stuff you do over a few decades, uh, and the amount of TV you're pumping now it's it's a lot so yeah I, I don't think he remembers everything but you know he remembers a lot of the high points and probably some of the low points especially with wcw well that's cool hey man let's uh let's segue into a little wwe stuff uh what's going on over there that's always the million dollar question there's a lot of interesting stuff going on over there uh on october 22nd they have tlc which uh it's a, it's a tough situation how you book that because you look at TLC, they, they brought back, they're bringing back the Shield, they're reuniting them for TLC uh, in a big TLC match. And then a month later, you have Survivor Series. It would seem almost like you would want to do the reverse, have that Survivor Series match, and then go to TLC and escalate things. But uh, it, with these themed uh, network specials or pay-per-views, they're kind of in a weird spot with TLC being slotted in October instead of December like it used to be. Uh, so that's that's interesting, seeing the Shield reunite. It seems to be very well received for the most part by the fans. They'll still boo a little bit at, towards Roman, but in general uh, – they're much more uh, favorable when it comes to Roman Reigns and how they're presenting him uh, with these guys as a unit. And I always thought, man, they should they broke up the team prematurely. And maybe you could say that was because then no one could see it coming. But, man, I thought they left a lot of money on the table with a babyface run because they were just very briefly babies. They were pr- primarily right. heels during their whole run. And I didn't know necessarily if all three were ready to go at the highest level. It's a lot of pressure, and, and, and sometimes it, you just need to – need a little bit more time and and then you're there uh and then you know you had some guys get injured you had some things go a little different than you anticipated and ultimately uh now we're here in 2017 and they are doing the reunion and i kind of hope that they at least have some sort of loose affiliation moving forward and it's not just a one and done deal well, it seemed like the uh, WWE fans really enjoyed watching Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose get back together. I watched that just from just from the pieces and bits that I've watched. I mean, hell, I enjoyed it. Uh, the, the whole storyline, I thought both guys did a great job in telling that story. I didn't see where they added Roman back into the mix. What are your feelings about that? Just just with respect to they were all going down a separate pass, and you know Roman was that lead dog, no pun intended. And then, you know, Seth Rollins and Dean, you know, they had some hot streaks, but then Seth right. had a couple of injuries. Dean kind of got, you know, just kind of strayed off a little bit. Uh, when they put those two back together, you know, they, they, they've had some awesome tag team matches together. They just have good chemistry. Uh, so I think they're doing really well together. And you know, that, there can be three solo acts there. But like you said, man, as a trio, they, they were really on fire. Could have had a huge baby run. So does this just kind of re-energize them? Does this slow them down as far as singular careers go? Or what's your thoughts on the whole process? Is there more money in the unit as a trio or as separate individuals? Now, individually, maybe the guys would prefer to get those paydays as a top act 
separate and apart, not split it three different ways. That's a whole different conversation. What's best for WWE and where they're going in 2018, I think it's better to have them right now, at least in the short term, as a unit. Uh, but you have to, when you have such a strong babyface unit, have uh, some big monsters to feed to them, or you're going to find yourselves in a, in a tough spot, and then they're going to you know, sit in a writer's room in Stanford and say, well, Someone's got to turn on someone in this trio, and that 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 I don't really want to see is something like that. If this thing gets if this thing dissolves on its own, that's fine, but I don't want to see one of these three guys turning heel unless it's Roman Reigns, because I'm down with a heel turn whenever, however, and I think he is as well. But yeah. uh, I don't know. All right, Corey, let's take a quick pause for the calls and give some big ups to True Car. When you're looking to buy a new car, you want to feel comfortable that you're getting a fair price. With True Car, you can get information that empowers you with pricing context and lets you see what other people in your area paid for the car you want. It's pricing you'll see before going to a dealership so you can feel confident when you show up. And with True Car, you can connect with a local certified dealer of your choosing. When you're ready to buy a new car, visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. Some features are not available in all states. And while we're on the subject of cars, all you have to do is go to GEICO.com and in 15 minutes, you could be saving 15% or more on car insurance. You can finish listening to this podcast and immediately after go to Geico.com and get yourself set up. Extra money in your pocket? It may just be the most rewarding thing you do today. Daddy, where do babies come from? Uh, well, uh... Honey? Mommy went to the store. Oh, well, you see, um, well, there's a mommy and a daddy, right? Right. And see, when they call Geico, uh, they could save a bunch of money on car insurance. Oh, really? And that makes them happy? Yes, that makes them very happy. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we could have this talk, Sunshine. (laughs) Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Hey, my name is James Petrogallo. I'm Jimmy Wisman. Please join us every single Tuesday for Crime in Sports. So fun. You like sports? You don't have to. Let's just set up a context and find out what an idiot did wrong. What I do like you it. say? I'm in. We're going to do that each and every week. We take an athlete, we break him down, we make fun of everything he's ever done. Yeah. But in order to do that, we have to build up and tell you all about their career and get you to what, James? To grace. grace. And That's then right. watch them fall from grace. Who as doesn't they inevitably like that? do. Join us. Big criminals, small yeah. criminals, sports you've never heard of. Yeah. doesn't matter. It's the crime. It's the comedy. It's such a good time. Join us it. every Tuesday for Crime in Sports. You can join us every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com, the Podcast One app, or subscribe on all Apple products. Find us every Tuesday and laugh at people. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. <laughs> Oh, right back with Court Byer, MLW. Sorry about the discombobulation there, Court. I hit the pause button. I had a call coming in. It was a call that I'd been waiting for, so I uh, didn't mean to interrupt your train of thought discussing, you know, how the show got back together. You talked about that, put that to bed. One of the things that you uh, sent me in a text message was uh, Neville walking out on WWE. What's the story with right. that? Is that a work shoot? Well, that's the million dollar question is what happened? He was uh, scripted or slotted to uh, be in the main event last Monday night and uh, he was going to face Enzo Amore for the championship. And uh, for whatever reason, he was not at the arena and they moved in a different direction and Kalisto, who was backstage at MLW, uh, ended up beating Enzo for the title, which you can go into that as a sidebar onto itself. But uh, the million dollar question now is what happened with Neville uh, and what's going to happen moving forward with him? Because uh, I thought that things were in motion for him to be kind of front and center uh, on the opposite side of Enzo Amore and what they're doing with him. And I thought he was doing great work in terms of getting his persona to a different level. Uh, his in-ring work was awesome. As always, his uh, his body looked like a million bucks. It was like, this seems like everything's going right, but you don't know what you don't know on something like that. It, sometimes it's a matter of uh, – cash sometimes it's a matter of creative sometimes it's just uh you just want to get out of there it it, it's who are we to say or no but uh one thing that a lot of people brought up is that austin aries who uh departed the company earlier this year was not so thrilled the fact that reportedly he uh 
wasn't featured on WrestleMania DVD along with Neville, which subsequently means uh, you're you're not getting that payday from WrestleMania because that even though it's still a DVD, uh, that that money's pretty damn good, and so uh, maybe it's something with along those lines. Uh, who we, again, it's speculation. You don't know. Uh, it's disappointing because I think it would have been a great pairing, uh, and, and I think it would have helped Enzo, and it would have been great to have seen uh, Neville positioned uh, something in a meaningful position whether you can you can debate whether the third hour is meaningful or not I, I think it's an opportunity but again he probably has his reasons of course so we'll see what happens with that but uh, it, that kind of guy on the independent scene or abroad will do very well uh, for a long time because he the independency I can tell you firsthand is probably at its best ever I mean I'm not saying you're you're, you're this new age territory system type setup but uh, people are doing pretty fairly damn well and he might be able to work the hotbed that is the United Kingdom and into Germany with groups like WXW and then jump overseas to Japan and then jump over to Mexico and work for the crash promotion in Tijuana or something like that and then work indies and and name his price and take as many dates as he wants and do rather well. It's hard to say, but he will definitely be a hot well, when's his deal up? Because just because if, if he – say the story is that he walked out on WWE, that doesn't mean, OK, he's going to get his papers. He's going to then be ready in 90 days. Like we know with CM Punk and a few other guys, Vince doesn't necessarily just say, OK, you want to leave? Adios. He'll be done with you when he's done with you, not when you're – ready to be done with him and we don't know if there's two years left on that deal two months two days two weeks two hours and so that is another big question about that there's more questions than answers unfortunately right now on the topic well i mean that's one of the things as you were sitting there breaking that down i was in like well yeah you can walk out the company because i did that way back in the day when i famously or I infamously mm-hmm. took my ball and went home but i wasn't looking to work any dates i was just pissed off and handled things in a bad fashion walked off the job so yeah man if i'd have Sprung up in some indie promotion in two months, you know, I'm, I'm sure there would have been some kind of a re- whatever they do to block you from work. And had I still been under contract, you know, with the, and I was, so yeah, just just uh, taking independent bookings uh, if it is indeed a shoot right out of the gate or or the third, like you said, the 90 day clause. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know how that's going to go down. You damn sure ain't gonna work if they say you're still under contract. No, you'll be in breach of contract. You'll have a lot of litigation pending. If you go down that road, he doesn't probably want to go down that road. And who's to say that in a week or two or in a day, he's he's not back there. With these kind of things, there's always a fluid situation, and and things can be resolved. And do you feel like it's a shoot, or do you think they're trying to work more storylines geared towards you know that that edgy kind of thing they did with Cena and Roman there for a few weeks uh, back to back to back on promos. <laughs> They typically like to uh, show some of that on TV or at least allude to it, and they, there was none of that on WWE programming last week. Uh, so sometimes you will retrofit something like that to create some sort of grayness over something. Is it a shoot? Is it, a re- is it reality? When I was with WWE, we did that with Matt Hardy. He was fired uh, over some craziness that really didn't involve the job but involved uh, Lita and Edge. And within, God, just mere – less than 30 days maybe he was back with the company working a shoot angle and i mean we we kayfabed everyone everyone backstage when he returned the the old continental airlines arena in new jersey we had him come in midway through the show and sit in a uh, town car with tinted windows right outside the building and then when he did his run in we literally ran and got him from the town car and ran right into the ring not Really, no one knew. I think we kayfabe some of the agents on that even. So, I mean, that was – I mean, if you really want to go there, you can do it. And it, I, I'll tell you, so it, in the moment, and it, if it's done right, it is a lot of fun because it's part of that magic that doesn't exist anymore. But then you also ride that line where you can also be – you're working yourself and it's uh, everything's a shoot or what's real and what's not. But you're kind of highlighting it, – it's all scripted and then you lose that – 
that thread of suspension of disbelief, which I hate when everyone says, okay, now I'm shooting, and they're on the mic. It's like, okay, so everything else we saw was bogus. Man, but when I hear about a guy walking out of a company, or or potentially, because I I don't know what's happening. When you brought it up to me, that it was news to my ears, but when after doing what (laughs) I did. Are you passing the heat here? No, 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 no. I'm not passing the heat. (laughs) Just just when I hear about someone doing something like that, if it is a shoot, I I just think, man, because I've been there and I did it. Yeah. I lost yeah. a lot of money. Uh, WWE lost a lot of money. We had to, you know, we got back together. It was a hell of a meeting between myself and Vince McMahon, and it was like the real, it, it was very, it, I hate to use the word surreal, but it was. When I got a card from Jim Ross one day, it had been months, six months at least after I'd walked out, and I got this card in the, in the mail, and it was from Jim Ross. And he goes, hey, man, if you ever want to talk, just give me a call. I'm around. Jim. Mm-hmm. So I gave him a call, and God dang, we wore out two old cell phone batteries. For two hours, I talked to Jim, and finally he said, Hey, man, you think if I put you and the old man together, you guys can hammer this out and you can come back to work? And, man, at that time, I was ready to come back to work. I would realized how dumb I was, how dumb the whole situation was. I'd worked myself into a shoot about doing a job and, and just the lack of a storyline. So, anyway, uh, being protective of myself, I took my ball and went home. And, boy, I was chomping at the bit to get back to work, but I wasn't going to call them first. Mm-hmm. Luckily, Jim threw me down that card, and when he did, so fast forward, well, go back in time, but fast forward back then, and... uh Jim says, well, you know, we're going to be in Houston on such and such date. Why don't I put you guys in a room and see if you guys can, you know, get everything straightened out. As I said, that sounds good. And uh, all of a sudden, I don't even remember the name of the building court, but it was some high-rise hotel. About I was on about the 27th floor of this big penthouse. I was the first guy in the room. There was nobody else in the room, and I was waiting. You know, I'm a <laughs> time fanatic, dude. <laughs> Vince didn't show up. You know, 15 minutes goes by, and I'm starting to think, man, is this a hit? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's up here or, or is it a rib what's going on your and, mind is thinking a lot of things for a that was a long 15 minutes so i don't know if the if the if Vince was working me or he was you know tied up or letting me think about it i don't know what he was doing but anyway he came in the room and it was really awkward we shook hands <laughs> and you know you know vince he's kind of a, you know he's jesus he's third generation promoter yeah. He's been everybody's brother, father, uncle, best friend, uh, advisor, shrink, psychologist, psychiatrist. And he makes that small talk, and it's pretty awkward. And then finally he just looks at me and goes, Steve, what happened? Anyway, we get, we had a, a, a real heart-to-heart meet, meeting and a, a come-to-Jesus meeting, and we shook hands, and I, I went back to work. And as I've said in all these podcasts since then, you know, I just handled business in the worst way. I'd worked myself into a shoot. I was working my ass off. I was running my ass off, you know, on a yeah. personal standpoint behind the scenes and just having a blast, and we were selling out everywhere. But I worked myself into a shoot situation, and I regretted it. So. Anyway, I, I don't know what this is with Neville, but hopefully everything comes to uh, comes together for him. Because uh, when you think of that, that's a real talented guy. He's a great fit in that mix. Uh, he's done, uh, to your point, he's done a lot of good with himself as far as kind of reinventing himself, turning over that heel character. His work has always been phenomenal. He's just flawless in the ring. Looks like a million dollars. So hopefully they get that thing back on track and, and uh, bear the hatchet or, 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 or just part ways and with a clean handshake and right. going down the road, you know, like a Cody Rhodes. Yeah, and uh, you just don't know how these things are going to play out and how they're going to get resolved. Uh, but it, it's it's always good to to have a place to go back and work and, and maybe hey, if it does, I thought Austin Aries did a really good job in how he he handled it and say, all right, I'd, I'd like to get my. Uh, my release. They went through the process, and then he was granted his release. Um, the problem that a lot of people don't, a lot, of, you know, like you just said, you were running hard, and you think about the 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 time you're on the road, the physicality aspect, the exhaustion, the mental fatigue, all those things converging, and then if you have if you're frustrated with one aspect of of the operation, whether it's cash, creative, or other, it, there everyone has that like that event horizon moment where it's like, okay, you know, screw this. And, and that's, 
that's possibly what happened here, or we're all getting worked right now. I don't know. We'll see, I guess. But I, I don't. Th- I think soon rather than later, we'll see Neville somewhere, and uh, it, whether it's the Indies with all these fresh matchups he can have, or uh, maybe in the main event of Monday Night Raw, uh, I think his name is going to be on a marquee somewhere. It's inevitable. Even after I just told that gut wrenching story, in all its reality, I hope that we're being worked. <laughs> you just never know, man. And and uh, I think looking at what's gone on with Enzo Amore and a lot of people jumping on him and, and criticizing him and thinking he spent $10,000 on the Conor McGregor uh, ringside ticket and, and blurring reality with uh, augmented reality or, or, or what's a work and what's a shoot. I mean, if you thought that Enzo Amore – uh, wasn't comped a ticket to a, sh- uh, a big fight that wasn't a huge box office uh, in terms of an attraction as a ticket mover. Uh, you're, you're the one that's working yourself, but it, it, there's there is like a uh, kind of a lynch mob effect when guys like that all of a sudden something goes viral and all of a sudden they jump on him and they create these narratives. And I think Enzo's done a really good job of converting that into an opportunity, as has WWE for him. I think he's done a really good job with his heel turn. And uh, some guys, they, they resist it because they're having this big babe face run. They're making merch money. Enzo's done a phenomenal job in the short window as a heel. I think he's done a great job, and I think he's going to have a lot of legs as a heel. Well, he's going to have a lot of legs as a heel just because the guy is uh, kind of a never-ending source of uh, Mm -hmm. words. And uh, I was talking with someone about him a while back, and Enzo's a pretty smart guy. and and He's a charismatic guy, and he he has a presence in a room. And so he's not just – he's got this – I love his character. I I love those outfits that he wears, but there's 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 more to that guy than just oh, uh, yeah. than just a guy that wears some loud outfits from Jersey. He, he's thinking about things. He's processing things. He's a really he's a really smart guy. I'm not talking about book smarts. I'm talking about just as far as his connection with the business. I think he lives and breathes the business. And man, you know he he can rub you the wrong way real quick. As as soon as he can get on your good side, he can rub you the wrong way. So I think it's something that he's that he's really having a lot of fun with and he's living with and uh you know when you when you look at him you know i think you're looking at uh whatever his real name is for a shoot turned up to an 11 just like i would say stone cold was so i don't think he's trying to be anything i think he's a very entertaining guy and I i think he's one of those guys who's certainly not afraid of heat and he's going to try to get as much heat as they'll let him get. And I'll tell you, that's one of the biggest frustrations I've always had is guys that will want to dial it down instead of pouring more gas on there and getting real heat. He's he says bring it. You know, he he did a he actually right before uh, his September pay per view match on Twitter put out this video, and man, I could see this video was designed for him to get some sort of pushback on on social media and he knows what he's doing he's a smart dude he's a dude that guy has hustled and hustled and hustled and done a great job and he's kind of like a throwback to me you don't see guys like that uh too often you know he is the real deal and like you said it's just cranked up to 11 and uh WWE needs characters, like real characters, and maybe he doesn't have the uh, the skill set in terms of finesse as a technician, but, he, dude, he is over, and you can't deny over, and he is that. Hey, man, speaking of over, let's talk about Sami Zayn and his recent mm-hmm. heel turn, because here's a guy I've always liked his work. Sometimes as a babyface, he can get a little bit carried away with the, with the, the cells or some of the mannerisms, but mm-hmm. I've always loved his work, and so now he turns heel and I'm happy that guy turned heel. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Because you're, you're watching more of this than I am, but I'm just glad to see Sam as a heel because I love his work. Yeah, I think uh, it was time because there's only so much you can do with a guy like that. There's only so many times, so many ways you can beat a guy. And I think there's a good run in him as a heel. And if he has a really phenomenal run as a heel, it'll rejuvenate him when he turns babyface. Yep. And I really like the idea of having Owens and Sami Zayn as a team because they have great chemistry. You have now a tag team dynamic. They also have two singles guys, and you can get out of a lot of matches with creative finishes off of that. And also, you have what could be a 
ferocious bilingual Canadian heel team basically on top in on the SmackDown roster along with Jinder Mahal and another heel foreigner. Uh, but I, I really felt for a long time that WWE's missed out on having some sort of strong babyface or heel presence from Canada where they really market it as Canadians own Kevin Owens, Canadians own Sami Zayn. They don't do it enough with Natalia. I think they can do it with all of them. Ironically, they're all on the same brand which is interesting and then you can have i'm not saying try to replicate the 90s but it works and it's a natural it's a natural thing and uh they could do a great job they really can and even in the markets of canada they can be heels when they say hey they're in uh say uh ontario and they just put over quebec you know there's so many fun ways to play with that even in canada or they can just have them be homecoming heroes throughout the whole country but I like the idea of them as a unit, uh, and I think Sammy, need, I, he really needed it. And I, I like the whole Canada played it as well, because if he wants to go heel, and he is, but but favor mm-hmm. Canada. And it's just like, you know, man, the Hart Foundation, man, they played upon right. that so well. And I remember the time we went over and worked. It was Calgary. Uh, I don't remember what year it was. It was myself, the Road Warriors. I can't even remember who all was in the match. Uh, and again, Shamrock, I think. Uh, yeah. it, was, uh, it was the Canadian Stampede or something like right. that. And that was a fun, that was probably one of my favorite pay per views of all time with that the ten man tag on top against the Howard, Hart Foundation, uh, dude. That was a loaded main event. You look at all the star power in that main event, and it was a, in your house. It wasn't a SummerSlam, it wasn't a Survivor Series, right. a Rumble, or Mania, dude. There's a lot of star power on that show, and the undercard was pretty damn good too. But dude, that was such a hot crowd, and what was so fun to, for me, I was a white hot baby face uh, yeah. all over the world, but that was heart country because they were from Canada, and Canada, god dang, they were going to love their hearts, and me, because I've always loved to work heel, even though I went as a, as a white hot baby, dude, I was a white hot heel, and we just yeah. we, we just flipped the scripts, basically, I, no pun intended, but we just, we just swapped roles, and I went out there and just hammed it up. I was doing everything I could. Maybe some of it might have been a little on the cheap side, but I was just, I was like a kid in a candy store. I love the crowd that showed up that night. I love the way Canada got behind the hearts and they were crapping all over me and the other guys. And it was, it was one of the most fun matches I've ever had. And like you said, it, it wasn't a big pay-per-view. It was just in your house, but God dang, what a hot crowd. And and also, just to go back to Sami Zayn, what I also like about his run as a baby, he's been so squeaky clean. He's been such a technician. He's played by the rules. You know, when mm-hmm. he makes that comeback, it's, you know, it's, it's finally time to slap at Matt and make that comeback. But now as a heel... To see that guy get really crafty with a couple of screw job finishes, you know, could really play to get some heat on him. So the, the way he's been such a squeaky clean kind of white meat baby could double down for him as a heel by, you know, going into the trick book and pulling out some dirty finishes. So I, I think there's a lot of yeah. potential with this guy. And I really wouldn't alter his entrance or any of his stuff too much. Very subtle stuff. But, but I like the. I would love for him to continue doing that rah rah baby face stuff when he comes out, <laughs> dude. That's heat. It's yeah. just a slight adjustment, and dude, that is heat. And, and and I don't think he should veer too far from that, uh, because again, if you do play the Canadian card, you can still be that baby face in yeah. Canada. Yeah. You know, they're not really. You know, I don't want to see. I don't want to see Sami Zayn walking out all stone faced. Oh no, I do no, not no! That's not that. who he is. Yeah. That's not who no. he is. He's got. He's got to be true to himself, and that, that's one of the things. Uh, I made an early mistake uh, on my heel turn right after WrestleMania 17 with The Rock. You know, it was like. As soon as I turned heel, I was almost already, excuse the language here, I'd, I'd already turned myself into a chicken shit baby face. Whereas that was total, you know, contrast right. to what the Stone Cold character was. Because I didn't I didn't run or, or hide from anything, wouldn't have Beg afraid of anything. Yeah. I, I, was, I started begging off. I kind of went into, you know, flare mode. Yeah. And, but, and, and that's with respect to the, the greatest wrestler of all time, in my opinion. But it didn't work for me. And all of a sudden, you know, I went from being that guy to being a chicken shit heel and it's like first of all no one wanted me to turn heel anyway as jim ross kind of puts it i'd kind of reached that john wayne level and people didn't want to see john wayne as a heel in the movies they didn't want to see me as a heel in the wwe i wanted to turn heel because vince always wants to do something big at wrestlemania but once i flip flop that character like that it, it really kind of shot myself in the ass and i i should have taken a more cerebral approach and thought about okay 
Switching Hill is one thing. Let's line up some opponents. Rock's going to go do movies. I think Triple H was going to end up getting hurt. Well, he did. He tore his quad. Yeah. So, you know, it wasn't like I had just a, 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 a giant stack of opponents. But, you know, what is this Hill process and, and how do I see it going down? Uh, so I should have thought more into that than just going into that other mode because that's kind of – that was the Hill mode that I knew from my technical wrestling days – as stunning, Steve, and I flipped back to it, but it was a mistake. So hopefully, you know, you know, Sammy and uh, the rest of the creative at WWE are thinking of, you know, they're playing chess rather than checkers with respect to the storylines because I was playing checkers. I admit that. Yeah, and one of the things I always look at is remember when the Road Warriors were heels, they were not very much different from when they were baby faces. You know, they were dominant, vicious. Maybe they used more foreign weapons and stuff. But beyond that, there weren't right. too many adjustments. It was just those little subtle things that you made. You went from man, those guys are dominant badasses to those guys are bruisers, but they also play dirty. Right. And and that those little those little nuances make such a difference. And I like the logic behind Sami Zayn's turn too. Some guys are just like you know surprise, ha ha ha. This was the plan for months. I like that he gave you a rationale that you could buy into and actually make an argument for uh, backing. And, and so it's not a heel just lying and, and being a thief. He had a real motivation, and I thought that that was a nice touch because sometimes you wonder how are they going to get themselves out of this one and they had something really nice uh and so we'll see where it goes moving forward but it smackdown needed a fresh in its lineup they needed to kind of move a few parts just to keep it moving uh because even if you look at jinder mahal he's basically cleaned out the the contenders to the title and aj's tied in still with the u.s title situation so uh they needed to just change up some stuff and um, now the other big question is what do you do with jinder mahal moving forward on smackdown because he cleaned out the division and one of the things that's uh, being speculated about Survivor Series could be Brock Lesnar versus Jinder Mahal. Uh, is a title for title? And if so, what do you think WWE does with that deal? Non-finish? Merge the titles? Flip a title beforehand? I don't know. Dude, what would Gary Hart do? Because <laughs> I'm thinking, well, you got Brock, who's due to, he's your number one guy. Right. Uh, gender, uh, I think the guy's done pretty damn good with, with his run. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's done pretty damn good. But right. if you're going to match these two guys up, just the way uh, Brock went through Braun Strowman with a clean finish in a pay-per-view or two ago, which I don't recall the name of, but with an F5, one F5 in the middle without anything devastating to set that up, with gender being a I mean, half or third the size of Braun Strowman, I, I don't see him having I, – I, well, let me put it this way. That's going to be an interesting match to watch those guys work to see what style or psychology they're going to employ. Because Brock Lesnar, whether it's an, whether it's an octagon or four-sided ring, that's a bad stick of wood. And, mm -hmm. well, yeah, I know it's a work, but I want to see these. If, if that's going to be the, the match, I'd, I want to see how they pull this off. Well, you have the, the outside heaters and the Singh brothers, so you can have them kind of like King Kong knocking away the uh, <laughs> the planes on the Empire State Building. <laughs> these guys can be flying off the top rope, and he's swatting them away, and then Jinder gets his stuff in and gets some heat off of that. Uh, you can have a few moving parts to that match, and you also have Paul Lee. But I think Brock – Going into Houston, November nineteenth for the Survivor Series, he's if they do that match, if they book that match. He's the de facto babyface, so that's going to be an interesting match to see how how they get out of it. Again, because you have right now as we record this, your SmackDown champion and your Universal champion and a match. And I mean, they could do something cheap, which would diminish the attraction and have. Dude, I'm seeing a, a DQ. A I'm seeing it. Well, okay, if it's non-title, then it is non-title. Really, it's pretty. I, that to I, me. He doesn't feel big though. No, I, I see it. It's, it's going to end up in a DQ because you can't just sitting here. I'm in Nevada and I'm watching the show as much as I can. We're talking on a Monday. Monday Night Raw and SmackDown are going to happen today and tomorrow. So I don't know what's 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 happening. But right now, with the run that Jinder's having, if you make that match, you're not going to pull that belt off of him just right now. And you're certainly not going to pull that belt off of Brock. So I'm seeing DQ or something. Yeah, I'm seeing a DQ with someone attacking possibly uh, Brock to set up something for the Rumble. Uh, who, what, when, where, I don't yeah. know. 
<laughs> yeah, that, that's the, those are yeah. all the questions. I mean, you know, we're here in October. Well, let me ask the show's your opinion. Oh, but let me ask your opinion. You, you don't think they're not they're going to take that belt off gender right now, do you? No, I think with a big tour coming uh, down the road uh, to India later this year, that I, I think that they're going to keep the title on him. I mean, they could do a quick flip, sure, and he could become and a two-time they, champion, no, but no, that diminishes the heat. Yeah, you can't. A no, quick flip, like, to me, don't do. And uh, first of all, I didn't even think about the big tour, but let's say the big tour wasn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. Just, at, just as far as this point in wrestling, I just think the kid's done a good job. You, you just don't yank that belt off him yet. He, that belt, sometimes you can give that belt uh, to people and it doesn't really help them out, but I think it's helped this guy out a lot and, and he's, he's done a good job with it. Yeah, and, and you're building heat, but the question is who are you grooming to eventually cash in those chips with? That right. that. That's not clear to me at the moment. I mean, you could switch someone out, or you could bring back John Cena, and he comes in and chases it. But I, I think that you you probably want to build this to WrestleMania, and I just don't see the opponent. It's not evident to me. And maybe, at maybe, of course, it will become clear as we get closer. But right now, because of the brand split, your depth issue is a problem. But that also creates new opportunities, and we we don't know who's coming in or what could be uh, down the road. But the other thing that's interesting that weekend in Houston is the night before, there's an NXT takeover, and in the main event, it's going to be the return of of war games. There's been a few war games since WWE closed. MLW had one in 2003, and there's been a few other places that have done war games, but this is a funky one because you have Sanity, which is head, uh, headed by Eric Young, and they're going to be a, a three-man team taking on the Undisputed Era, which is Adam Cole, Bobby Fish, and Kyle O'Reilly, and they're going to be taking on the Authors of Pain and Roderick Strong with Precious Paul Ellering in their corner. So it's it's a, a triple threat three-way in the war games with two rings and the steel cage. It's a little different than the, the old dusty roads version of it, but it's kind of cool to see war games back and on the WWE network. God dang it. Uh, what are your thoughts on those authors of pain? I think they have a long way to go. Um, I, I, I they, they they're where they should be. They're in NXT, and and they think I think they need some 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 TLC. I think they've done a great job in packaging them. I think they've given them credibility with Paul Ellering, but they they just they just need experience. That's just that's why NXT exists. That's why WWE Performance Center exists. Uh, and in time, I think they'll they'll be uh, ready for the main roster, but not right now. No, and, and I agree with you. But I, they definitely have potential. They have a, they yes. really have a good look. They're big. Enough. Enough. And man, I tell you what, when they were working those tags with uh, Dash and Dawson, and then uh, God dang, what's that? Gargano and Chompa. DIY. Yeah, DIY. Man, I tell you what, you could see that those guys were carrying them, but they were doing their part. And so I, I think they, they do have potential. They got a good look, good size. They just need more reps. So I think I'll be fine. I'll tell you what, it's interesting that they're bringing the war games back because that's a difficult match to work, mm. especially, you know, back in the day. When you said war games, you knew there was going to be blood and there was going to be buckets <laughs> of it. God, yes. dang it. got to be. <laughs> I'll never forget I did that one I worked uh, with all those guys. It was 92 or 93. And, man, I hit a good one. I had a gusher. And yeah. right there in the middle of the ring, uh, Dustin, we did something together, and he was on top of me, pounding my head. And he looks down at me. He goes, God dang, he goes, good color. I said, thanks, as we continue. To, it's the things that you don't know are happening in the ring that are happening yeah. in the ring that you hear about later. But, you know, there's a guy complimenting you, you on how good of a color you got. And then you're, you're saying, hey, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Keep beating me up. <laughs> so it, it's going to be interesting to see how they work that match just because I, I, I just, uh, you know, you can't go back to that court. But and, and I can understand why, but I, I'm a guy who came around in the years that I did, so I can appreciate the, the, the color a- aspect of it. What are your thoughts on if they were to get a green light and they could just go in there with a couple of gimmicks and get some color, what would your thoughts be? I'd rather people blade than get it hard way, which is the new like in thing to do. I, when I see guys getting 
color hard way, I cringe. I'd rather see someone take a blade and, and slice themselves than do the hard way deal because then you're you're really potentially doing damage and you have no idea what that what that's gonna look like. Is it you know, it could be really great, but you also might be doing unnecessary damage and you don't need to do that. You know, a, a nice slice But of is a blade. it too barbaric to see all that blood in the ring these days? <laughs> Has the wrestling or the sports entertainment crowd gotten past that or is it too shocking to go back into that brutality is what i'm asking man that's 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 been the debate for over 30 years there, there's been vince has waffled on it over 30 years and he's had no color rule and then the color comes back during his hottest runs with you on top you guys were bleeding a lot and making a lot so i just think it's all in moderation and you have to do it the right way and you also i think wwe does a phenomenal job i mean their meds are phenomenal Phenomenal. Their testing is great, so you, know, you don't have the necessary concerns you did with the old days, the Wild Wild West days, and worried about any sort of transmission issues or anything like that right. with it comes to you know HIV or all that bad stuff. So I, I think if you're going to do it, WWE has a really good system in place in terms of checks and balances to to make sure, to at least limit the liability, the risk of, of something bad happening. And I, I think we went. We went too far deep with the color years ago with everything was just blood and it was just too much and it lost its impact. I was seeing shows, major shows, where you'd have guys getting busted open in the first or second match. It's like, man, <laughs> what's happening here? You know. Whereas, I think if you if you do it at the right moment, it me it's meaningful and and a cage match should have it. And, and not seeing it on a cage match is kind of weird. It's not the end of the world. But I remember watching as a fan the '94 Owen Hart Bret Hart cage match at a SummerSlam, and I'm thinking this is a good match. They got a big issue, but there was no color, and it felt. It felt weird, you know, right. and to the uneducated eye, to, to see that, it didn't feel – something was odd as a fan to me. It was like this is a big confrontation of violent match. It should have a violent conclusion. And War Games, uh, I would think you would need that too. And this match is set up where you have the, a nice heel faction in there. The Authors of Pain could really – they could do some damage in there, and they should do damages, uh, damage in there. Uh, it, the weird one to me is who are the baby faces? They they recently switched Sanity uh, out of necessity to balance the roster as their babies. The Undisputed Era with Cole, Fish, and O'Reilly, uh, they're, they're heels. So it's it's a weird kind of it's, – it's weird because it's a triple threat, which is kind of a cluster uh, in a War Games, and it's, you, have, you have nine guys in there. Uh, and uh, the defined babyface role doesn't feel like, putting like sanity as a baby as babyfaces in jeopardy in that deal feels kind of funky. Yeah, and it, it it is funky. But to go back to your point about all the testing that they employ with you know all the guys these days, and certainly before all the boxing fights, the MMA fights. I mean, there's tons of blood over there. Yeah. So the fact that you know that they you know I was looking past that. Hey, man, as long as you do your testing, I mean, you know everybody's cool. You know what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no dude. If I was running things, I'd I'd go back to a little bit of color on your more important angles, just because I think it's highly effective. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll tell you, it's like sometimes it does happen accidentally, and all of a sudden the crowd goes, ooh, and they're a little bit more engaged. I, I saw it firsthand with my show. We had uh, Lawler versus Jeff Cobb, and uh, Cobb got busted. His, his nose got busted open, and then you see Lawler as a UFC fighter throwing those fists. Man, all of a sudden people are really buying him. They're like, man, did he just – they tag his nose. What happened there? They're just a little bit more energy in the, the the arena. There's just that blood just kicks it up a notch. But it has to again be selective because you don't want to see guys pouring buckets on match two or three. War Games is definitely the match to happen, uh, and I'm glad that they're bringing back War Games. Vince, when we were when I was there. He was – Dusty pitched it, and uh, Vince just like cut him off halfway through the pitch saying, thanks, Dream. I think we're going to go in a different direction. <laughs> and that's really – I mean that's a lot of why they went with Elimination Chamber. It was kind of like – and that predates right. Dusty's time and my time there. But it was kind of like this compromise of we'll do something big and dramatic but not war games. But And then there was also the debate of, well, when you put two rings next to each other, you're cutting off a lot of seats in an arena and – the Houston arena is like your classic NBA arena. It's the Toyota Center, so it's not like you're dealing with Cowboy Stadium. I mean, it's 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 a decent, it's a smaller, decent-sized arena, uh, not a stadium. So you would definitely 
definitely are shaving off some seats, but maybe for NXT they figure, well, is the difference of 2,000 seats going to mean the end of the world? So I, I think it's worth it, and I think it's going to be a great attraction for them in November. Here's one for you, though, that I'm bummed that is right now not on the network for November, and that's the return of Starcade. We have War Games, and then just a, a few days later we're going to have uh, the return of Starcade, but it's a house show uh, in the Carolinas. Why is it just a house show? That's the million-dollar question. It's November 25th, Greensboro Coliseum, the Greensboro Coliseum, where the first Starcade happened in 83. And all these years later, I don't know why they're not putting this on the network because it's a, it's a pretty damn loaded sh- uh, lineup. You have, uh, sh- you have a flair in a cage match for the title with Charlotte uh, – challenging Nat- N- N- Natalia, who's the champion. You have Jinder on top with the Singh brothers versus Shinsuke Nakamura. Another steel cage match. It's a loaded... Sh- and that's that's just the top two matches. You have a pretty decent undercard, too. So why isn't that on, on uh, the network? To me, I would love to see that. Hey, bring in Tony for that one, too, because... That 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 market goes back to eighty three. Dude, and, uh, that Greensboro Coliseum is one of the best buildings I've ever wrestled in. It just it just it lives, breathes, smells, is wrestling, pro wrestling. Yeah. yeah. So it, the fact that you just gave me the card, I see a title change in the women's division. Oh, I love it. I'd love to actually watch it live too. But that that to me would be a great match for also to WWE if he's up to it, if he's health wise. In the clear, dude, you gotta have a camera there. You gotta just have one camera there, because if there's not a title change in that women's division, there's got to be a screw job that's just uh, just gonna get so much heat from Natalia. But either or, if Charlotte were to go over there, just just a historical part of that, and then if Natalia was to screw her out of it mm-hmm. and get major heat out of it, I mean, you got to win win either way there. I mean, but Charlotte well, winning, I think, would be so awesome. It'd be un- unbelievable. I'll give you one better. She wins it, and then Rick comes in there and hugs her, and it's the first. First time we've seen Rick since the health issues in uh, St- at Starcade in Greensboro. That's a huge moment. Yeah, that'd be cool. Hey, uh, what's the story? Uh, getting on into this thing uh, before we close down shop here, and I appreciate mm-hmm. you jumping in to help me out here while I'm over here on uh, that vacation in Nevada. Uh, what's the story with Daniel Bryan's future? That is another big question. He has uh, less than a year. I think it's next September 28th, 2018, that he'll be technically a free agent. Now there's there's guys like Cody out there, Cody Rhodes, but technically he can't call himself Rhodes on uh, in Ring of Honor, but Cody Rhodes uh, sending overtures to Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan having fun with it on social media and uh, also having fun with other people on social media. He's growing out his hair, something I noticed. Like, hey, look, his beard's a little scruffier. His hair's a little longer. And then word comes out, yeah, he's uh, he's growing it out because he hopes to lose his hair, put it on the line down in Arena, Mexico at some point down the road. So he's got all these ideas he really wants back in. Uh, and and the reality is he's going to be able to name his price coast to coast and in Japan and in Europe, anywhere in the world when he becomes a free agent and take his select dates, probably make a ton of money on merch. But he won't be able to merch yes because it's a WWE trademark and the yes, yes, yes thing. So I uh, still think he'll make a ton of money on merch. But uh, it, it, it seems like all, all indications point to a – post WWE wrestling return for him. He he's gone on record saying he's doing a lot of therapy that's uh proven to be uh pretty positive in terms of uh working towards his uh concussion issues. So uh if that's true, uh you know he's he's doing his due diligence in trying to uh get acclimated and get prepared for this and, and also protect himself. Uh I think a lot of companies in Japan would love him. You have All Japan Pro Wrestling that's coming back pretty decently here in 2017, and I think they'll continue to grow. You have New Japan, you have uh, Rena Mexico, you have all these indies that are just exploding. You have the UK. I mean, it's like he, he, he'll he be turning down more bookings than he's probably going to be taking, but he's going to kind of do his bucket list and, and have his run, and I'm sure WWE at some point down the road would still take him back as an on-air personality. Uh, what's your take on Daniel Bryan Wrestling? wrestling in 2018 well i was going to ask you the same thing uh, because <laughs> i was a guy that got dropped on my head and yeah. had a lot of uh, cervical issues and uh got a bruised spinal cord all kinds of things happen from that he's got a different issue but it's along those same lines it's neuro- neurologically his brain my spinal cord you got to change your work style you know i was more of a scientific guy you know i was trying to be the next rick flair 
like a lot of guys were. And it really wasn't working for me. I was, I was able to work myself into the spots that I, that I put myself in with the Flying Brian, television titles, United States titles, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But, you know, after I got dropped on the head, I knew that I needed to change my style, and I did. I became more of a brawler, and I actually enjoyed. I love watching guys really wrestle, but I also enjoy the really good brawlers. And I, I think I did a pretty good job of combining the two and turned into a pretty good brawler and having the success that I did. Bottom line was... I changed my style. Back when I was yeah. going through all these doctors, one of the leading guys was back in the day of the kind of injury that I had was a guy named Dr. Joseph Tor, got of Philadelphia. And he would not clear me to get back in the ring. And I said, listen, you know, he thought the business was a shoot. So I had to smarten him up. I said, listen, doc. I said, I don't have to take a pile driver every night. He goes, what do you mean? I said, I can control everything that happens to me. He goes, you can? And I explained to him how. And he says, well, well okay, with, with that being said, then if you can avoid certain, you know, mo-, he didn't know the word bumps, but paraphrasing, if you can uh, limit the amount of bumps you take or pick and choose, you know, how you wrestle, then yeah, I will clear you to get back in the ring. And he did, and I had the career that I had. And then retired at 38. So Daniel Bryan, here's here's my here's my biggest thing with, with Daniel is at, you know, because I I was 6'2", you know, 255 to 60, whatever I was during my wrestling uh, career. At that time, you know, I could conceivably turn into that brawler. With uh, Daniel Bryan's, you know, he's had that, that missile drop kick, you know, those, you know, all those, the headbutts, yeah. uh, all the stuff, that flying stuff, you know, when you when you run and just jump, dive, I don't know, the tope a or the tope, I don't know the, what the names of these things are called, but he's got to be able to change his style. And, you know, man, I still worked my ass off when I came back as a brawler. And I, I didn't I didn't call myself a brawler. I just you know, intuitively changed my style so that I was being safe. I'm I'm down with it. If he can be safe, and, you know, what I suffered was called an axial load. That's the number one cause of quadriplegia, getting dropped on the top of your head, or these uh, football players that lead with their head and hit with the crown of their helmet. That's that's the number one no-no. You never want to do that. So I was able to avoid those circumstances. Can he avoid, you know, getting that that brain rattle around inside that skull, you know, taking your back drops, taking your body slams, you know, the, the, you know the, the, the turnbuckles, you know, some of the obvious things were you're going to make some impact on that mat. If you can do that, you know, and, and get back into the ring in a safe fashion, you know, I'd be down with it. But, man, even on a high spot, I mean, just, just as far as, you know, that, that good stiff tackle, you know, tackle drop down hip toss, okay? Mm-hmm. Taking that tackle, you know, when you're when a guy's running the ropes with authority and hitting you with a little bit of mustard, and, you know, you're taking that bump, I mean, that's a pretty good flat back bump. And is it devastating? No. But when you've had as many issues as he's had, then it's more of an issue. So I just wonder how he will dance or work around, you know, the issues that he's had. I understand he's been looking at ways to do and address what you're talking about. One of the things I think would be great for him is that he's done a lot of MMA training. He does a lot of grappling. He does a lot of jujitsu. He used to train at Extreme Couture when he was living in Las Vegas. I think working more of the old early 90s UWFI style where it was a lot of – it was very shoot-esque, a lot of kicks, a lot of that kind of stuff. You're not running the ropes. You're not doing that high-flying stuff, but a very ultra-realistic style that works a lot of match submission wrestling, uh, Zack Sabre style stuff. I think that's what we're going to see out of Daniel Bryan in 2018. And it's like with Muto, again, not head trauma, but he had – his knees were shot. They were devastated by the turn of the century going into 2001, 2002. And when he acquired All Japan and was the top guy there, he realized, well, he's got to carry the burden of this company. And he has to be the top guy because he's the most uh, popular guy in the company. He's the most over guy and he has the biggest profile. And so he reinvented his style and he went from doing the great Muda – Kijimuto stuff of the 90s and in the 80s and did a different style altogether and that included introducing the world to the Shining Wizard which was basically just a running knee to the head but he got himself over and became like a super white hot attraction in Japan and beyond with just a few just 
key little adjustments, and everyone thought he was a genius for it. And Terry Funk reinvented his style. If you look at Terry from the early 80s to the 90s, he totally changed his style. I mean, he was a bit of a brawler, but he used to have a lot of scientific wrestling in him in the 70s, and by the 90s, he was a different dude. So it can be done. Dale Bryan's a very cerebral guy, and he has a lot of time on the shelf to think about what he could do to change it, to alter his career style, to have longevity. I, I, I'm optimistic that he can get it done. Uh, it'd be great to have Daniel Bryan back. Like you, uh, wrestling is richer and better for having talent like you and Daniel Bryan in it than not. And if he can pivot like you did and reinvent himself, uh, that would be that's it's a great story. I'm a big fan of the comeback, and I'd love to see Daniel Bryan, whether it's in a Japanese ring or a Mexican ring, wherever it is, doing his thing at a high level. Uh, I think everyone's rewarded for it. Well, I think because he was he was so over and universally loved and respected as a worker yeah. in the ring by everybody. Yes, I think there will be some like uh, people say, "Hey, man, hey, man." It's kind of obvious he's working a different style, or go along with it because, hey, man, they're accepting of his situation. You know, this is what the guy's got to do to stay in the ring. What he's got to do is not get lost in the moment and go yep. back to those trademark bumps. But we'll see what happens. That's down the road. Uh, and, and who's to say that WWE won't keep him around and, you know, make him an offer he can't refuse? And, you know, that's going to be uh, a big decision for him to make, you know, when that time comes because it's not easy. Uh, I can understand that guy desperately loves the business of pro wrestling and really loves to be in a ring and work in a match. But then there's also a side where you say, hey, man, you know, I could stay here and do this. I know I love being in the ring, but mm-hmm. here, here's a trade-off. Hey, wh- whatever it is, it's going to be an important decision for you know him and his wife uh, that they will make together, I would imagine. And then look at Terry Funk. He retired a million times. And it's it was it's it's intoxicating for many, and you find yourself just you'll find you'll find a way to make it work. I think I think we outlined a few ways for him to address it, and I'm sure he has even probably better ideas. But it, it it's 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 a great time to be in wrestling if 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 the doctors can clear him, and and that's that's what we're gonna hopefully see uh, either way happen uh, in 2018 because uh, there's so many opportunities out. There. I don't, I don't think wrestling's been healthier as a whole in a long time, and you could probably point to maybe some companies being a little unstable at the moment. Um, at the moment, but there's a lot of great companies that are are exploding, whether it's in the UK or it's in Tijuana or all points in between. So I, I think wrestling's ticking up right now, and uh, within a few clicks, you can just about watch anything anywhere, anytime, which is also pretty cool when you look at where wrestling's heading. And uh, WWE's got three brands that are just uh, giving you different content, good stuff. And and like any company, there's going to be good, there's going to be bad, and, and, and a little bit in between. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what 2018 brings, whether it's WrestleMania, New Orleans, or Daniel Bryan. There's a lot of good stuff on the horizon. Is there a guy right now on the roster that's on your radar and you're going, hey, man, this this kid right here, he's got something? Yes. His name is Darby Allen, and he is he's a bit like a new age Jeff Hardy. It's the best way to put it. I, he wrestled for us. He is a punk rock type guy. He actually was on ESPN as a skateboarder. He was on MTV's uh, Ridiculousness or whatever the hell it's called. He was really he's he's a very compelling guy. He his movement in the ring is kind of like Jake the Snake. It's very different, uh, but his his fearlessness is very much like Jeff Hardy's. His charisma is like Jeff Hardy's. Uh, he's a guy that I highly recommend people check out. Another guy who I think, he's only 21, only been in the business for two years, is MJF, uh, Maxwell Jacob Friedman, and he is a heel's heel. He gets heat, he can talk. You know, the, the thing I'm missing from so many guys is they, they, they get heat, but it's almost like entertaining, like, ah, oh, yeah, 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 okay, boo, haha. This guy gets the the real heat and i've missed that he's the real deal he was trained by kurt hawkins out of long island uh and he can go in the ring as well and there's a guy that reminds me of a new age ricky steamboat named jimmy utah who is another guy that's been around only a year or two uh 
Uh, he's Japanese American. His father uh, was in the Navy and uh, was over in Japan, met his, his wife, and they had Jimmy. And fast forward here 20, 21 years later, he's a great prospect. He actually, because he has dual citizenship for the last, I don't know, several months, was training in Michinoku Pro out in Japan uh, and being mentored by great Sasuke, Ultimo Dragon, those guys. And dude, I have, I've been looking for a thousand years because I'm a huge Ricky Steamboat mark yep. for the next Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. This kid is as close as I've seen in all my time in wrestling. Like this guy is phenomenal, and he's putting in the work, working all over, taking as many days as he can to get that experience. So those are three names, and I could go on and on, but those are three names that I really, I'm really high on those guys. And if, check them out if you want to look at new age talent; they're pretty damn good. Hey, I'm going to check those three guys out because, man, I, you know, you, uh, you made a good statement there. You've been looking for the next Ricky Steamboat, and there really hasn't ever really been the the new Ricky Steamboat. Everybody's talking about hey, the new Hogan or the new Flair or the new this or mm-hmm. whatever. But yeah, there hasn't been the new. It's almost like that movie, Searching for Bobby Fischer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, about the old chess player way back in the yeah. days. A great, great movie. And so it's like, yeah, searching for Ricky Steamboat. Who is the next Steamboat? Uh, how, how tall is this kid? He's deceptive. He's he's probably taller than Ricky. He's about six one. But what I love about him is he knows how to sell like Ricky and fight from underneath. Baby faces that can fight from underneath. He has certain qualities. He just – it's – I haven't seen, I haven't seen in a, uh, forever, you know, and I always had hoped because Ricky's one of my favorite all time wrestlers, the true blue baby face that yep. was universal. He can go in any territory. He was a baby face and he was, he never was heel. Uh, and, and Jimmy, just how he sells, uh, he, he's, he's got those qualities. And if he continues to develop his arsenal, uh, and get experience, I, I think, uh, I think he's got a lot going for him and just great timing, great athleticism because Ricky also was a, just so crisp in the ring, just so polished, uh, you know, those deep arm drags he would do. But the, really his legacy is fighting him, uh, fighting from underneath and registering uh, in, in his selling. I mean, he was just, just a master of it. And he didn't – I mean, his promos were pretty – Eh, but they're basic promos, but it was he had great fire and he could fight from underneath all day long. Yeah, to me, the, it really started when he was in the ring, and so we'll, we'll stop and start it uh, with that uh, last thing and talking about uh, looking for the new uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Yeah, this kid's name comes into play uh, along with the other two guys who are prospects that you are high on. WWE just had some tryouts last week in Orlando. Uh, yes, catch any scuttlebutt, any rumors, any who are they who are they bring it to there man are they they're going college football players former pro football players hockey players what's going through their court yeah they got a lot of football and rugby players and i the rugby guys some of them have transferred over to uh pro the pros uh there was a a Samoan that I used to work with, Mana, out of New. Well, he's actually a Samoan out of New Zealand, but he was a rugby guy and he was a badass, tough dude. And uh, there have been a lot of rugby guys that have flirted with with pro wrestling. Uh, Bad Luck Fale did a little bit of rugby, and he's a huge beast from New Zealand as well. Uh, Gama Singh's son. Uh, if you're a fan, we were talking earlier about Stampede Wrestling. Gama Singh was a big uh, big guy out that way. His son had was part of this tryout. Uh, this past week in Orlando, former TNA knockout Madison Rain, also part of the uh, tryouts, which was cool to see. Former NFL tight end Wesley Saunders, uh, also there. But oddly enough, I didn't see a lot of amateur wrestlers like I thought I would see. Uh, usually see a lot of those in the mix. Not so much this time, but they 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 constantly doing these tryouts. Uh, I thought it was interesting. They had, uh, I believe her name is Kavita. Devai, uh, she's the first Indian woman to sign with WWE. She trained under the watchful eye of the great Kali out uh, in India. He has a big school, and he's he's been running a lot of shows. I guess one of them he legitimately grew, uh, drew about a year or two ago, 50,000 people to it. Uh, Ricardo Rodriguez worked the show, and he told me firsthand, he said, man, that's a shoot. I don't know if they paid or not, but they had 50,000 people in a building or a big soccer stadium out in India for one of Kali's shows. Uh, so that's pretty crazy. And they also signed uh, Shadia 
Bezeo, and I'm sorry I'm butchering her name, but she's from Jordan, and she's the first WWE Middle Eastern female wrestler ever. So they've made some big headway in terms of just bringing in a lot of unique talent, very diverse roster, and I think wrestling's at its best when you have a little bit of everything from everywhere. So uh, an interesting lineup for last week in Orlando, and uh, I'm always intrigued by who they're bringing in and what they're looking for and where they're they're going for it. Um, there's a lot of talent, and a lot of these guys we haven't heard from or heard of. Madison Rain, she's she's probably the one that stands out the most, uh, and so it's cool to see her in the mix because they need experienced women from NXT all the way to the main roster uh, to fill out their divisions because they have three women's divisions actively moving and touring every week, and so it's cool to see her in the mix. Machine keeps rolling. Court, I appreciate uh, you joining me here on the podcast today. Uh, let, let's plug something, give some people awareness of uh, what you're doing, where they can find you, or what you, whatever you want to talk about. Sure, you can get me on Twitter at Court Bauer, same with Instagram, and this Friday, 10 a.m., set those annoying calendar reminders on your iPhone, your Android, whatever. 10 a.m. MLW.com, 10 a.m. Eastern this Friday. Get your tickets for the December 7th event in Orlando at Guilt Nightclub. Tony Schiavone will be in the house. I'm pretty sure Matt Riddle versus Tom Lawler is going to be going down. We're going to have a hell of a follow-up show. We'll be filming it. You don't want to miss it. Get those tickets this Friday, October 20th, 10 a.m. Eastern at MLW.com. And that's the bottom line because Court Bauer said so. Court, good talking to you. Hey, good talking to you too, man. All right, everybody, give me the go-home cue. It's time to wrap up his podcast and ride off into the sunset. But before I do, I want to thank Court Bauer of MLW for joining me on today's podcast. It's always fun talking about the business of pro wrestling with Court. And I uh, always uh, enjoy looking at his insight and his opinion. As far as something to watch, hey, man, as you heard on the podcast, his show that he had down there in Orlando, Florida, is streaming. If you have the four ninety nine to check it out, Please do. I'm going to check it out myself and offer my opinions on it. But it sounds like he had some good talent down there. The show came off and uh, delivered to the fans. And that's what you got to do. You got to deliver. Hey, man, if you guys are watching or if you ain't watching, make sure you got your DVR set to CMT Tuesday nights at 10, 9 central for my show, Steve Austin Broken Skull Challenge. I'm telling you, this is the toughest season we've ever had. And you're about to find that out as these next episodes start dropping and i'm telling you it gets tough it gets rough out there you're not going to want to miss it all the t-shirts i'm wearing out there they're selling them at prowrestlingtees.com forward slash steve austin we'll get some good ass t-shirts this year best ipa on the planet broken skull ipa by el segundo brewing company you can find it in cali at whole foods and total wines and if you ain't in cali check out inside the seller.com and see if they ship to your state if you're looking for a badass pocket knife, which I think everybody should have, check out the cold steel broken skull knife and a new working man knife. And you can find them at my new Amazon store. Amazon has the best price on both knives. Just go to Amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Steve Austin. Got to say one more thank you to all the fine sponsors of the Steve Austin show. That's how I'm able to do this podcast for you twice a week for free. And you can find all my sponsors at podcastone.com. Just click on the killer deals button at the top of the page and then click on the Steve Austin show banner. And speaking of Podcast One, the new Podcast One app is now available for download at the App Store or Google Play. There ain't another podcast app like this one anywhere, and that's because the new Podcast One app is loaded with some cool features that let you do a lot more than just listen to your favorite shows. You can access behind-the-scenes photos, articles, and connect with other fans of the shows you like. And you can watch over 1,000 360 virtual reality videos. You can actually watch some of your favorite shows in virtual reality. It's like you're sitting right in a room with them. So get to the App Store or Google Play and download the new Podcast One app now. Folks, until next time, my name is Steve Austin, and I will catch your ass down the road. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million, what color is the White House? Um, I know this, I know this, I know this, um... Five seconds. Oh, switching to GEICO could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay. Judges? That's true, Kevin. Bill and Owen, congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. 
Shooting suspect arrested, threat to kill the president. I'm Tim McGuire with an AP News Minute. The suspect in the shooting of six people in Maryland and Delaware, including three who died, has been arrested. Wilmington, Delaware Police Chief Robert Tracy says 37-year-old Radi Labib Prince was taken into custody by ATF agents who were searching an area in northern Delaware shortly after they found his car. When he saw that they had spotted him, he actually took off running, threw the gun, and they were able to apprehend him about 75 feet later and recover the gun where he threw him. Investigators say Prince shot five co-workers at a Maryland company, killing three before fleeing to Delaware.